The Sino-American War was a devastating worldwide conflict that helped bring about the current state of the world in fallout. Although wastelanders do refer to the Great War, this only technically relates to the atomic strikes that ruined the world, an engagement that all up only lasted about two hours. The Sino-American War was technically classified as a separate conflict, a predecessor to the Great War, that lasted for more than a decade as the two world superpowers clashed in a titanic struggle. Leading the US was the unnamed last president of the United States and his Congress, alongside military commanders such as General Constantine Chase. For the Chinese, Chairman Cheng and President Xin held power, with commanders such as General Jing Wei leading their troops. Both sides championed the war effort on ideological grounds. The United States would claim that the war was a battle for the values of liberty, freedom, and free market capitalism. The People's Republic of China affirmed that the fight was won between the peace-loving people seeking equitable resource distribution against the Wall Street fat cats and their warmongering politicians. Ironically, as the war dragged on, both nations began to become mirrors of each other as they invaded their neighbours, ravaged their own citizens, and dragged the world down to an abysmal end. For all their ideological propaganda, the Sino-American War boiled down to one of the most basic causes of war throughout history, resource shortages. The war was one unlike any other. Battle raged on the continents of the great powers, in the skies, the waters, and even apparently the moon. The Sino-American War, however, was ultimately won without a victor. All of mankind's progression, all of their triumphs, all of their failures were rendered obsolete when the two most powerful countries on earth decided to settle the score definitively and launch their nukes at one another. The fallout tagline may be that war never changes, but this war did change everything. Now, before I get too much further into this, I'm anticipating I'll probably need to issue a disclaimer about all of this. So, this is a summary of a fictional war between fictional representations of two real-world nations. Any content from the in-game universe is not a reflection to their real-world counterparts or the peoples of said nations themselves. All of this is just a fictional history that was of interest to a fallout dweeb such as myself. The Sino-American War was not a conflict that escalated overnight. Although tensions were apparent between the two global superpowers, neither side initially had any interest in outright conflict with one another. However, from the middle of the 21st century, the delicate balance of international relations began to wobble as nations around the world began to suffer from shortages and resources. There were a number of resources that were sought after. Food, water, uranium, but in particular, fuels such as oil were the most sought after. The European Commonwealth, our universe's version of the European Union, had fought a desperate war with Middle Eastern nations for control over their oil fields, which ultimately ended in a Pyrrhic victory. The oil fields of the Middle East were run dry, while the European powers began to fight one another for supremacy and resources within their own territories. The loss of the Middle Eastern oil fields were felt globally. By the year of 2060, nearly all traffic in the United States had dried up as fuel became too expensive to be wasted on civilian automobiles with the estimated cost per gallon being $7,450. In their drive to alleviate disaster, the United States government made drastic yet fruitful strides to obtain alternative sources of fuel. Nuclear fission was utilized as a source of clean nuclear energy that was able to fuel automobiles with companies such as Mass Fusion endorsing the technology that would keep America from collapsing in upon itself. Electric vehicles were also heavily promoted as a substitute to oil. Outside of fueling vehicles, the US also made immense strides into renewable energy sources to address the issues caused by the global supply chain. Poseidon Energy had constructed a solar power plant, Helios One, in the Nevada desert, while wind farms such as the one seen in Far Harbor sought to cut dependency on foreign nations for the operations of towns and cities across the United States. Things were not all roses for the US, however. Although many United States corporations continued to reap profits and keep the economy technically afloat, the effects of economic hardship were dramatic for the average citizen. Inflation rose drastically. Pre-war prices seen indicate that even the most basic of goods were incredibly expensive. 
A copy of the Capital Post newspaper would cost you $56, while a dozen donuts from Slocum Joe's Cafe would set you back $200. American families buckled under the weight of economic loss. This, combined with the impacts of the new plague, a virulent disease that had run rampant since 2050, caused dramatic discontent amongst the American population. The United States government, however, sought to dismiss the political discontent by labelling protesters as having communist sympathies, discouraging assemblies, and capitalising on xenophobia to retain power. A vigilant citizen hotline was even set up to allow citizens to report apparent seditious or socialist behaviour to the government. There were evidently Chinese agents operating on American soil who sought to steal technology and impede their military efforts. China's success with stealth technology was incredibly effective, with the US only ever able to construct clunky replicas such as the Stealth Boy. However, by masking all political discontent as being openly anti-American behaviour, the United States were able to cover up their own failures by turning their own citizens against each other. Ultimately, from a resource shortage view, the US continued to chug along. The United States retained the largest remaining sources of oil in the world, further supplemented by their advances into alternate fuel, such as nuclear fission and electricity. However, this was not the case for the rest of the world. The People's Republic of China was largely reliant on fossil fuels in comparison to the United States. With oil fields drying up across the globe, China turned to its fellow superpower to export its reserves of crude oil, offering extremely generous compensation for the trade deal. The US rejected the terms of all offers, however. China at this point was in an incredibly desperate situation. In order to stall their collapse, the nation had begun invading and annexing its neighbours within the region, laying claim to their manpower and resources. However, this solution had only really slapped a band-aid over the hemorrhaging that the resource shortages had caused for China. In their mind, having no options left available to them, and having all diplomatic efforts made with the US rebuffed, China launched an amphibious and aerial invasion of Alaska at the end of 2066, seeking to lay claim to the bountiful resources of the region by force. The war that ended the world had begun. The Chinese assault on Alaska took the US government by surprise, with large sections of the state swiftly falling under the control of their invaders. Led by the brutal leader, General Jing Wei, Chinese paratroopers dropped deep into enemy territory while land forces deployed on the shores of Alaska. With a combination of foot soldiers, chimera tanks, and stealth-suited Crimson Dragoon squadrons, the Chinese army laid waste to the US forces. The unprepared Americans were caught between a hammer and an anvil, with extremely heavy losses for the defending troops. Resupply was also made incredibly difficult, as Chinese submarines and warships hunted the Americans within their own waters. This resulted with America pressuring Canada to allow access for safe land routes and airspace within the Canadian borders. Although Canada did capitulate, it was initially too little too late, as China occupied Alaska and laid claim to its precious resources. Supplies such as oil, uranium, wood, and captured spoils of war flowed to the Chinese homeland, allowing it to replenish and enrich itself. China's leader, Chairman Cheng, was vindicated to his detractors. His gamble had paid off and China once again had a consistent supply of oil for the nation. From 2067, the Alaskan front had degenerated into a stalemate. US forces deployed their earliest models of power armor, the T-45 model, as a new form of mechanized infantry to counter Chinese forces. Although clunky and encumbersome, the suits enabled American forces to stabilize the Alaskan front. General Constantine Chase was even able to retake some occupied territory but was unable to make any true headway in the campaign. However, this stalemate suited the Chinese occupiers fine, who pilfered the Alaskan pipeline extensively, but was slowly killing the United States government. In desperation, the open border policy that the Americans had strong-armed Canada into led to many more liberties being taken upon their neighbour to the north. From 2069, Canadian forests, oil reserves, infrastructure, and food were requisitioned by the US, who pressured Canada to support their war effort. Protests erupted as Canadians took to the streets to declare their opposition to US occupation. However, things only truly escalated in 2072, after Canadian freedom fighters attempted to sabotage the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline. 
In retaliation, the US government chose to annex the entire country itself, utilizing the sabotage as a pretext. Canada was absorbed into the United States and classified as a protectorate. The resources and infrastructure required assisted in bolstering the United States economy and their war effort, but it did also cause the military to begin fighting a war on two fronts. One against the Chinese forces in Alaska and another against renegade Canadian military forces defending their homeland. As the stalemate continued, both Chinese and American scientists sought to use their ingenuity to turn the tides of war. For the Chinese, biological weapons were developed to be deployed against defending forces in Alaska. For the Americans, a giant robot superweapon named Liberty Prime was commissioned, a nuke-throwing, freedom-loving weapon that was meant to liberate Alaska. Both projects were ultimately unsuccessful and only really served to draw much-needed resources and manpower away from the war. The stalemate began to break in the year of 2074 in favour for the Americans. Frustrated by their inability to liberate Alaska from the invading forces, US generals settled on a plan to fight an offensive war rather than a defensive one. Deploying from American bases in Guam and Japan, US forces landed in the Philippines utilizing the nation as a staging ground to launch assaults onto mainland China. Chinese troops were evidently stationed in the islands, with harsh fighting occurring on the island of Mamajo. With the Philippines falling into the United States' hands, further incursions were launched onto the Chinese mainland, with a daring amphibious landing on Shantou in the Guangdong province. The Americans now held a foothold on mainland China, small though it was in comparison to Alaska. Ultimately, such incursions gradually slowed down to a stalemate similar to the Alaskan Front, however. For the United States, they were now fighting a war on three fronts, consisting of the Alaskan Front, the mainland Chinese Front, as well as insurrections within Canada. Martial law was enforced with Canadian freedom fighters executed in the streets. On home soil for both superpowers, things were almost just as grim. Citizens were traumatized after having a near decade of war encompass their entire lives. Even those far removed from the front lines could see the direct effects of war. Soldiers returned, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Resource shortages were dire, now not even on fuel, but basic necessities such as food and water. Nearly all public funds were diverted from civilian projects, causing publicly funded services such as police and hospitals to deteriorate. Xenophobia ran rampant in America. Executive Order 99066 authorized the imprisonment of Chinese and Chinese-American persons, as well as citizens suspected of being sympathetic to communism. Many of these individuals were detained at checkpoints and housed in concentration camps, or utilized in cruel, arbitrary experiments. Although we have far less concrete information on the status of pre-war China, the resource allocations were imagined to be just as dire. Terminal entries found of a Chinese spy indicate that the reward for his services entailed his family back home being given priority in the next round of food and water distribution, which was apparently allocated via lottery. Evidently, since it was used as a payment for their deployed troops, a secret agent no less, the situation within China was incredibly dire. In 2076, the war truly began to change. Although having waged for a literal decade at this point, both sides had not really accomplished many of their objectives. True, the Chinese had occupied Alaska and retained a supply of fuel for their nation. However, any gains would have been lost from the tremendous economic and personal hardship of the men and equipment thrown into a decade-long meat grinder. Change for the US was heralded by the arrival of the T-51 series of power armor, representing a dramatic improvement over its T-45 counterpart. First deployed to reinforce the US troops occupying Shantou, the T-51 allowed the American military to make dramatic grounds against Chinese forces. Chinese tanks and armored vehicles had no real answer to power armor, with their own attempts at reverse engineering their own versions proving largely ineffective. The culminative effects of 2076 saw dramatic impacts for the Chinese theater of war. Although no major objectives were initially captured, the renewed offensive from the Americans caused ripples throughout the occupied and annexed nations in Asia. Supply lines were heavily disrupted, causing even further shortages across their territories. Annexed nations in Asia, similar to the Canadian insurrectionists, began to revolt against their occupiers. 
Chinese troops were diverted from fronts in Alaska and Shantou to suppress the uprising in neighboring annex states with varying degrees of success. On top of all this, Alaskan oil was still being pipelined, but the disrupted supply routes meant barely any of it was able to reach their forces in Asia. In reverse, Chinese forces in Alaska were unable to be regularly resupplied, beginning to be buried under a mountain of US troops. The destabilizing effects of disrupted supply lines coupled with renewed American offensives from American troops found the Chinese forces surrounded on all sides. In January of 2077, Alaska was finally freed from occupation with the liberation of Anchorage and the death of General Jingwei. The liberation of Anchorage allowed the US to regain their precious oil reserves desperately needed to fuel their armies and prop up its failing economy. With hundreds of thousands of troops able to be reallocated, the assault on the Chinese homeland was also able to be spearheaded on multiple fronts. Bolstered by the additional T-51 power armor troops, the foothold in Shantou was able to push enemy forces in all directions. Meanwhile, an amphibious landing deployed to assault the city of Shanghai, pushing all the way through to Nanjing, while a simultaneous campaign was launched from within the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. Given that the Soviet Union and the United States appeared to be on semi-cordial relations, it could be theorized that American forces were given permission to cross borders to launch an assault through occupied Mongolia. Great strides were made as Chinese and conscripted forces in the outer regions of the Chinese sphere of influence were recorded to surrender to power arbor wearing troops on site. However, the further into the mainland the US pushed, the stauncher the resistance became as the People's Liberation Army rallied to defend their homeland. Brutal and devastating fighting erupted between the two foes, young men and women thrown into a grinder for a war that seemingly had no end. Yet very few of the foot soldiers would be able to conceive the fact that the war would be ending relatively soon, just not in the way that they might have imagined. Anticipating the increasing likelihood of an atomic strike against the nation, the last president of the United States in his inner circle relocated from the White House to the Poseidon Energy oil rig. However, the government itself did not lead from the location, merely maintaining its silence. The United States was in effect leaderless. Original estimates from the Defense Intelligence Agency had calculated that the Chinese nuclear strike scenarios would only succeed in eliminating 41% of America's atomic weaponry stockpiles. Large portions of the continental United States would be destroyed by the nukes, yet the leaders of the US were optimistic that the enemy would be completely annihilated, leaving them to retain the mantle as sole superpower. Yet these estimates were evidently well off target. On October 23rd, 2077, at 9.17 am, confirmed atomic strikes struck the United States. Although technically unclear who had launched the bombs, the President of the United States ordered a retaliatory strike against China. At 9.26 am, nearly the entire arsenal of the United States nuclear stockpile was launched at China and Chinese occupied states. By 9.47 am, both the east and west coasts of the United States were saturated with atomic weaponry. We technically do not know who did strike first. Conventional wisdom does seem to suggest it was China, as President Richardson of the Enclave states that the damn raids launched everything they had at us. However, theories abound that the first strike had been launched from other sources, ranging from aliens, the Enclave themselves, and even vault tech Ultimately, the Sino-American War technically ended on October 23rd, 2077, with the start of the Great War. A decade of warfare had led to the global collapse of the world's nations, and a brand new dark age for humanity. Wastelander historians would classify that the war did end on October 23rd, 2077. However, due to the nature of the war's end, no official armistice or peace accord was ever reached. The successor to the United States, the Enclave, did view themselves as the winners of the war, as they had survived, albeit in a diminished capacity. We've never received any confirmed reports on the status of post-war China. However, if the nation still exists in any form, they would no doubt mirror the Enclave's messaging that it was they who won the war. It is a bit of a moot point however, since the Enclave no longer exists and China, or any successor state, has made no appearances in the post-war world. To end the video, I'd like to summarize the Sino-American War with the following joke. Did you hear about the two nuclear superpowers that got into an argument? 
No? Well, they had a fallout. 